Don't talk to me. I won't. Oh, that's the first sip. First sip of the day? It's the first sip of the day. You didn't have a sip of coffee before you came in here? I don't drink. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, dude, I can't get out of the house. I got to have my coffee. Yeah, I've sort of trained myself to not have it first thing. Plus, I have my beans that I like. I got my grinds that I like. Now, are you are you still making it in the in the Keurig or the or the Nespresso machine? No, I'm grinding beans. Are oh, you doing the whole thing? Yeah, um, the Joshua Tree coffee. Love mm, it, Joshua Tree coffee. Yeah, love it. I think I've had that before. So good. Well, God, that's okay. There, damn, there is some... it tasty? What's that? Oh, we're just chatting here, buddy. Yeah, we're we're, we're chatting. It. Is Megan coming today or no? Running a little late. <gasps> oh. oh. We're gonna start an excellent the star. We get to roast <laughs> Meg. Now, Megan's one thing not here. I'll say about Megan is she's gonna come in. She's not gonna find it funny. She is gonna be sweating. She's gonna be upset. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, how are we gonna navigate that? I we're gonna we lean right into, into it. it. Just lean <laughs> like right it's into an it. open moon, and we're gonna push on it as hard as we can. <laughs> Absolutely. Because that's what that's, that's what, what friends people, do. That's what friends that's do. That's what friends do. That's, that's what, what friends, friends do. do. They yeah. find somebody who's they find in distress. A they find the pressure point, and they just go right. And out. here oh she is. Oh. Wait, well, wait a minute. She's well, on time. Well. She's, She's on time. Right on time. <laughs> She's on time. You are gonna get it. You should see my parking job. Just diag, full diagonal parking. We should have Glenn analyze. It. We were like wolves who noticed one of the wolves is like limping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were about to just attack. But yeah. the problem is, we what happens when, when you come over to the wolf? It's nine o'clock, so she's on time. I'm on time. Yeah. The, the metaphor was would be you go over to the wolf, and it turns out that she wasn't limping at all. Oh, she was trying to yeah, lure you in so that she could in. find out. And there are other wolves behind you now, and yes. you're like, ah, well, good job. She wanted to figure good out job. who the wolves were that were going to come. Is that what was happening, Meg? Uh, no, it's just that you guys have forgotten that the wolf can cut all this. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, this doesn't even true. have to exist in the episode. Yeah, the wolf but doesn't want it I think to. it's more like the wolf just like had a thorn in its foot, and the other wolves were like, oh, maybe we'll get to eat this one today. And then, <laughs> and then she and was then, like, nah. Nah, I, I like, got the thorn out. And, and, like, and then the other wolves like, oh, okay. Hey, cool. sorry, man. We weren't really going to eat you. No, that was a joke. That, yeah, was, a, that was a joke. Just a joke. <laughs> but the thorn is out. You're, you're fine. A friendly ribbing. And <laughs> here we are. I don't even know how to do this. Well, I'm uh, sure Meg's might. got some sort of a structure. I do, yeah. Do you really? I do. Well, yeah. I was thinking that we could discuss Fool's Paradise first. I've written down a bunch of questions. And then I thought we could get to Blackberry second. It's probably a good um, idea. Because you're involved in both, so you won't oh. be as bored in the first one. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I might fall <laughs> I would <asleep>. think. <laughs> okay. If that's all right with you guys, does that work out for you? That seems good to me. I, I was really looking forward to this episode because, uh, and hope all the creeps out there will, will get to notice this, because I don't know if the listeners will, but it's going to be, they. I don't know if they thought about this, but it's going to be very uncomfortable for them. You mean from a, co like a compliment yes, standpoint? Yes, <sighs> because it's very hard. It's very hard to sit there and be complimented over well, and over and over mm -hmm. again. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it anyway, I, but not because I want to make them feel uncomfortable because I'm so proud of them, both of them. Okay. And I can't wait much. to get into the specifics. I, I mean, I I, th I think I'll be more comfortable with it than I was when we were in front of 9,000 people in Dublin. And it was like, I don't want to like, <laughs> sit here and, and take it. All right, let's get um, to it, shall let's we? Let's talk yeah. movies. I want to talk about, because I, I do want to talk about your movie. We've all watched and, each other's uh, films mm -hmm. and we're here to talk about them. Um, go. <laughs> <laughs> Take a look at this guy. What about him? He's a dead ringer for you. This man don't look nothing like me. I mean, look at him. He's too short. You can finish the day for you. <laughs> Action. Cut. Latte pronto. Excuse me, Mr. Pronto. Can I call you latte? Latte. Latte pronto. Latte pronto. Is that so, your oh name? God, I'm amazing. So you and me are going to do big things, pal. Bad respect, bro. Mo, Mo, stars coming through. Do you want me to start off? Yeah, let's have yeah, start. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to start by asking Charlie, uh, how did this film come about? And it's sort of like a chicken egg situation. Did you decide that you wanted to write and direct something and then came up with an idea for what you wanted to write or direct? Or did you come up with the idea first and then were like, oh, I'm the person to write and direct this? The funny thing about this thing is I've been tinkering with it 
as sort of like a passion thing for a decade. So we were on season 10 of the show and I was starting to feel pretty confident in my ability to write and execute something. And I'd done some rewrites on some feature films that I'd been able to act in. Um, but I'd also sort of realized I, I didn't have control over those films. Like, like they didn't, the way that we have total control over Sonny, we have the final say. So as I was writing this movie, I thought, well, if I don't direct it, I might get in a situation where someone's making it something I don't want it to be, and that would suck. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of realizing that I had to direct it. And then there was a piece of me that, forgive the comparison because it's, you know, everyone's all up in arms about it, and I understand, but like I loved Woody Allen movies. I, I loved Albert Brooks. I loved things that seemed like they were a singular voice from a mm -hmm. person. So I, I think I always wanted to do that thing. Uh, and then I love certain types of movies, like Being There, which is obviously the closest relative to this movie. And I was like, I'm just never going to get the opportunity to be in a movie like that. They're not going to make them. Uh, mm -hmm. And then feeling like a certain kind of style of movie was just not getting made, or even like a Coen Brothers movie or Paul Thomas Anderson or these sort of auteur-driven things being like, well, I don't know, the phone might just may never ring. Uh, so a combination of just some confidence with what we were doing at Sunny as a boot camp of how to do it. And then a desire to be in a certain type of movie was the sort of initial like, well, let's just try to make one. I imagine too, with a type of movie where you're not speaking in the movie, not having control over that thing would be doubly impossible because it would be like you lost your voice in two different ways. <laughs> yeah. Like to have somebody else tell you how you're supposed to do a movie like that yeah. would have been. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I just want to start by saying I was so endlessly entertained. But I've I've always been a big fan of this movie in its earliest iteration. I mean, you you sent me a script for this for a version of this. Yeah, it was different, but it had a lot of the same elements that yeah. are sure. I, it's it was probably sixty per sixty to seventy percent of what you're actually going to see in the in the movie. It was in that initial script, and certainly the style and the feel and the comedic sensibility, the the Hollywood satire aspect of it. So I've been a, a fan of every single iteration of this, even you know when it was, you know, this thing of like, how do you make a movie with a protagonist that doesn't speak <laughs> and doesn't want anything, which was and doesn't want, but more even more importantly, doesn't want anything. Yeah, and is literally it literally breaks the number one rule of screenwriting, which is having the main character get pushed around, yeah. get like forced into other things, yeah. like it, it being just just like a, a vessel of other people's motivations, and right. yet and yet somehow like that was the th but that was also the thing I loved about it, and that I still love about the movie. Um, uh, so I, I just, I just want to, before we start getting to all the questions, like, I just want to say, like, I, I just love the film and oh, man. it's so funny. I love, I love every single sequence. It's never not totally entertaining from beginning to end, you know, and okay. it's constantly like opening itself up and you're meeting new characters and like exploring different sides of the business and, uh, you know, I, until, I it, until it really spirals out of control at the end, Sure, you know, and you're, you get to meet like the people behind it, you know, yeah. now was that? Yeah, I, it's like I don't want to totally give away, yeah. but it's um, yeah, you you kind of meet the uh, you know the people that make the people, the people that make the people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what I, what you just touched on, I think, is what is a good kind of primer for people to understand before they go into the movie, and it makes it that much more enjoyable. That I think the idea that the main character doesn't want anything is the point of the movie, because I think yeah uh, that you and I'm taking this from the movie itself, not even conversations that we've had that I think the idea is that people will project what they want to onto the main character, yeah. right? And so the audience is doing that. Every character that's surrounding the character is doing that and they're creating something that is just a reflection of themselves, mm -hmm. not yeah. the person. I, mm -hmm. Like I've never seen that before. Even being there wasn't really quite that. No, it's a slightly different thing. Right, where, well, it seemed to apply to this town, right? Which is yeah. built on persona and ego. I remember sitting and thinking, I was reading an article about The Rock, and then I switched over to some other entertainment article about Justin Bieber. And I was thinking, what are these names? And how do we just accept them? And like, <laughs> you know, it was talking about like Biebers and things. And I was like, that's a, that's a strange sounding word. Now I know that is that that man's name. But like The Rock, we just started calling a man an inanimate object. And we were just, well, we just well, like- he was a wrestler. I mean, you know- yeah, they, for sure. You, but like- we, the wrestling world, there's a lot of that. We, we went for the ride, right? Um, yeah. You know, and the, he walks down the street, someone will go, there goes The Rock. And I was like, what a strange 
<laughs> sort of concept. Like, so the idea of a name and an identity and what that is it just seemed like fertile ground. Well, for it's that super kind of, effective, you know. Yeah, it, it, because yeah. it it creates a mystique and a mystery and a conversation. You know, the edge. You know, the the, the, yeah. the guitar player or Slash. Yeah. yeah. You know, it creates like wait, wait. This person goes Madonna, even. You know, a right. one a one name. You, you it doesn't compute because my name is Rob McElhenney. <laughs> yeah. Right, which is like very. What if somebody was like, I want to be called Mushy. <laughs> Yeah, you know I mean, everyone call me mushy. I'm sure that someone's work. probably even tried that. Yeah. But then also there was something interesting. Remember the story that I think we were talking about, maybe you had overheard it, where Jack Black was like in a casting office and he had just done like, what was his breakthrough movie? It was- um, Which, which the, one? Uh, High Fidelity. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. And right, right. he heard someone saying, get get me the next oh, oh, Jack oh, Black. Yeah, yeah. That's like the Hollywood, the Hollywood oh, the story. Oh, Hollywood, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right, this is this is the progression of a Hollywood actor, right? Yeah. A Hollywood, fa a famous Hollywood actor. It's who's Jack Black, and then it's get me Jack Black, and then it's get me the next Jack Black, and then, <laughs> and it's, then and it's, it's who's Jack Black, and then it's who's and Jack, it's who's oh, Jack Black. Right, it, comes, yeah. it comes full circle. It comes full circle. So I, I thought in that uh, already is an inherently entertaining structure for just a, a mm -hmm. story arc. Yes. But then wait, he, wait. Can you tell the tell the creeps and listeners what the inanimate object is? Because <laughs> well, that's I had an idea. In writing this, this was in the very first draft, and it just stayed that like someone asked someone for a latte pronto. They were just always yelling for a latte pronto. And then Ken, who really drives the story, uh, Ken Jong, overhears Ray Liotta asking someone for a latte pronto and assumes he's talking to me and assumes my name is Latte Pronto. And then everyone just starts calling me Latte Pronto, which is actually a really cool name. Which is yeah. a decent name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Latte you can Pronto. Believe people would go for that. Yeah. But I think the introduction of Ken's character is where the satire really gets uh, so much deeper because, you know, as Rob was saying, like there's this projection that you can do on a character with no wants or needs. And so you might, if it were just Latte Pronto, you might watch this movie and say, oh, well, uh, that's just the wrong way to go about things. You actually should have these wants and needs. But then you have Ken Jong, who is a character of nothing but needs. Desperate I mean, wants desperate and needs. Desperate wants well, and needs. Yeah. And it was a real acting challenge for Ken because, you know, he's known as... Yeah, listen, I, well, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about was his performance in the film. I, I think those, those emotional moments are crucial to making the movie work. Um, me too. I, I love those moments in the movie. I, those really grounded it for me. Same. Um, I, I think he gave a performance unlike anyone's ever seen him give. Without yeah. a doubt. And I, I think... Uh, it caught me, it really caught me off guard. It really yeah. caught me off guard because again, I've seen the movie before, but I haven't seen the newer stuff that you shot where you added more stuff with Ken and, and kind of doing the things. I essentially about. made him the main character, you know, like, or, or like split right down the middle in a yeah, way. Yeah. But he's the protagonist, right? He's driving the action and he goes on as much of a, of a mm -hmm. rise and fall emotionally as, as my character does. But um, with Ken, I remember saying to him, listen, people are used to you doing a very sort of, it's almost like a sarcastic sassy mm -hmm. uh, sense of comedy that he does. It's very funny. Really funny. When he does that, it's really funny. And I was like, Ken, you can't do this for this character. You have to be a thousand percent earnest. Yeah. You can, the character does some manipulation and some lying, but he has to do it in a very earnest, very... Mm -hmm. What was his reaction to that? Like, did he, was he... Like, I don't know if, was he worried that he wasn't going to be able to deliver that? No, because he, he felt is like he did a such thing really. a, he's a dream to work with because he he wants to do a great job. And that's everything, right? So he's willing to, sometimes we would do many, many, many takes. I pushed him hard. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I would feel like bad. I'm like, I don't want to break this guy. He's like, you know, he's, we're jamming these scenes in and he's working, but he was just willing to do it and willing to, just be more honest. And I was learning to be more honest as a filmmaker where, you know, a lot of the stuff and my second pass that I got was just sort of like Ken on the streets. And I just wanted to put him in a natural environment and kind of hide the camera a little bit and make things feel more alive and, mm -hmm. and more honest. And he was just willing to go for it. And uh, I, I would not, the movie wouldn't work without that. Um, I just needed that humanity, that honesty from his character to, have the movie have a sense of purpose. 
it also like makes the satire so much more effective because you guys do this all the time on Sunny, but I always think the the best version of a satire doesn't fall whole, wholeheartedly onto one side or in the other. So if the movie just condemned Hollywood and said that there's nothing good to come out of this sort of place, mm-hmm. I think it would be less effective than to say that this relationship between the two of you is this one bright spot of hope within an otherwise kind of like bleak existence and and therefore I think makes the satire land a lot well, more. Well, I start the movie with, with Peter McKenzie, uh, who uh, we all know as the as the doctor from Sunny, who tells you that uh, you're, <laughs> that Jackie, uh, Jackie Jack Denaro is obliterated. obliterated. She's lucky to be alive. She broke her arm, a few ribs, punctured a lung, shattered her pelvis, compound fractures in both legs. Her breasts? Excuse me? What about her breasts? I'm afraid that they were uh, obliterated. And he is such a comedic assassin because he plays things so honestly. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted a honest, believable doctor sort of saying that my character, we meet him in a mental health facility at the, at the beginning of the movie, and we we don't know what his issue is. He's lost the ability to speak. We don't know why. And he's saying, you know, if he can have like one meaningful connection, perhaps he can break free from this yeah, psychos- yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. psychotic state. And then of course he delivers a, a really great line about like, the state's not going to pay for any of that. We're going to oh, put, no, his, we put his ass say. on the first bus yeah, yeah, downtown, yeah. which only he can do in uh-huh. that way. But then the entire movie becomes about can both these men find a meaningful connection in Hollywood? And that turns out to be a difficult place to find any sort of real humanity. Those were all the things that I, I needed to discover. And I, it was just a hard path to find it. Well, one thing it seems that you had a grasp on from the very beginning is, you know, you mentioned some of the influences and I, I 100% could see, could see them in all the best ways. Woody Allen, Robert Altman, Hal Ashby, P.T. Anderson, even the best like of Buster Keaton and, yes. and Charlie Chaplin. Yes, there's a splash and, of it. Well, sure. so much of it to me felt like anachronistic, where you don't know what time frame yeah. it, it actually yeah. exists in. So that makes it timeless because it's clearly modern times, but there's a sensibility from both the 70s and the 30s. You get the all sense of like all of all every year of Hollywood all mashed into <laughs> yeah. one. Yes. One, yeah. That was what I, I wanted to do with the design, with the costume design, with the the, the cars that I would pick for mm-hmm. the characters. The bus at uh-huh. the very beginning that the bus. you get dropped off. And then I got nervous for a while, like making it that like, oh, like this is a mistake. You know, people want to know what the hell time a movie's taking mm, place in. I disagree. You know? I disagree. Yeah. I, I think know, that I, makes it, that's what makes it feel like a fairy tale. I came full circle on it. Yeah. But my initial instinct was that I wanted to sort of satirize Hollywood through the ages. Uh, but I also knew that there were some unbelievable aspects and heightened aspects to the story. So I thought maybe I should, from a design standpoint, I could get away with pushing things a little further. But then it got scary, you know? I was like out lost in the woods in the editing room being like, is this, have I gone too far? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then going back and finding some stuff with Ken emotionally, grounding that, weirdly gave me more room to go further with that stuff. Can we stop and talk for one second about John Bryan's score? Yeah. Oh, his right. music? Yeah, yeah. I mean... But that's what's so amazing about a composer of his talent and and also experience, that he can look at that movie and say, okay, so this... It seems timeless, which with the wrong score can be a mess. Yeah. But he was able to weave that in so that it feels like it all fits together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there were things that he scored that in my temp track were much more upbeat. And he went, He again, it was like learning how to try to find some kind of truth, even though truth is like an elusive abstract concept. Uh, but in a movie that is where it's all a fiction, right? But um he would he he scored some things much more earnestly than I had initially done, and mm-hmm. it was absolutely the right choice. But I was kind of like, "Hey, where are your instincts taking you? Let's go explore them." And I'm going to stay out of your way. You've made great score after great score after great score. I'm not going to tell you how to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, there was some temp track stuff that I had in that he just loved, like these old sort of. Uh, Les Baxter and Nelson Riddle tracks, which were these really sort of full Hollywood scores. The ty- the way they arrange the music, they don't do anymore. Uh, it, it's this is like some music theory nerd nerd out stuff, but like 
just the way the chords are arranged. He had these things that we would call the uh, omni chords. And when you hear it, it has like a, a throwback sound to it where he would say, oh, you know, should we do this one a little more omni? And he would start to arrange the music. And I, I, mean, I would just get more and more blown away as he did it. And then to s listen to the full orchestra, you know, I, I said, look, I'm going to let you take the full orchestra and as many musicians, like, wait, you're not going to try to cut corners and say, I got to like double up sounds. And I'm like, no, just free reign, go. Um, and he was excited. So he was recording with old microphones and, oh, cool. uh, yeah. oh, just all these tricks where he said, make sure the French horns point the horns at the back wall so that the sound bounces off the wall and back in. That was, without him, I don't know. You know, you need everything to come together. That's why making a good movie is so hard because you can yeah. get, you can literally get almost every single element right and then you screw up one thing like the score. The score doesn't work, ruins the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Ruins the whole thing. Yeah. And it's interesting too because there's a big sort of like Hollywood idea of like, well, we can cut corners there. Like, let's not spend too much on the score. Let's not, you know, give the composer too much or like, let's just throw in some. And you know, if you think about all your favorite movies, music is such a big part of why the movie works. Um, about John Williams, I mean. Yeah, look at John Williams and, and Take all, all the music out of Star Wars. Yeah. You know, they've done that, right? People yeah. have Jaws. done that where they, they pull, Jaws, yeah, you yeah. pull all the music out and watch it, you're like, this doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Jaws with the mechanical shark's not working and then he's like, well, what if you just hear, dun, dun, and now we just associate those two notes with sharks? Yeah. <laughs> it was incredible. Um, I, I do think that, uh, I mean, Talk about a man who doesn't want to hear a compliment. I do think John Bryan is up there in terms of that level of talent. Oh, yeah, man, I was like, uh, yeah, no, he's so, so talented. Oh, guys, today the show is brought to you by our friends at Mint Mobile. Well, from Rob's friends at Mint Mobile. Well, now, hang on a second. Rob's friend at Mint Mobile. Okay, well, today uh, the show is brought to you by Rob's singular friend <laughs> at Mint Mobile. He actually sold it, but um, it turned out well for him because he found a way uh, for Mint Mobile to make him money too. And guess what? It can make money for you Wait, as it well. can make money for us because yeah. I want some it of the money that it, it made for... It minted him a bunch of money, and it, I, it, it can mint me money. How? Uh, I mint me. I mint me money. Is it is it because Mint Mobile offers premium wireless on on the nation's largest five G network for only fifteen dollars a month? No, 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 no. I, I'm, no. I'm no expert here, but what are you talking about? Fifteen dollars a month? What what's the catch? Well, there actually is no catch. Mint's the first company to sell a wireless service solely online. They cut the cost of retail stores and pass the savings directly onto you. And they give you the best possible rate for you and for your family, which could just be two people what do you what do you mean what do you mean like like uh do you know anybody who's well jade you know uh who from our ad sales uh is a single mom and she's made enough money or saved enough money from mint mobile that she's planning on taking her kid on a trip this year okay so to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month that's right it's crazy 15 bucks a month wow okay and get that plan shipped to your door for free go to mintmobile.com slash sunny that is mintmobile.com slash sunny. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash sunny. Did you know that for every minute, a new seller around the world makes their first sale on Shopify. It's packed with industry-leading tools and an extensive business course library so you can gain more confidence and control over your brand without having to learn any coding or design skills. It's there to empower you to reach, reach the next level. Whether you're selling handmade miniature 
thimbles. <laughs> little things. You know what I mean? Little tiny things. Little we're widgets. selling Sunny Podcast merch, mm -hmm. right? Uh -huh. Like we do. Uh -huh. Or you're selling Waystar Royco to whoa, Gojo. Whoa, uh, you whoa. Know? Hang on a second. Shopify can help close billion dollar deals like on Succession? Big deals, baby. It can make you a killer like daddy always wanted you to be? Glendale Roy? <laughs> is, that, is that what we're saying? <laughs> yeah. They're not really going to be closing those kinds of multi-billion dollar deals. No, this is, yeah. you know, this is more for the 99.9% .9 of self-made business people out there who want to sell their goods. So if you were to say, uh, I don't know, market a uh, brand of t-shirts and trinkets that say, fuck off. Well, that's Shopify's bread and butter, isn't it? I should have delivered it, delivered it uh, more like, fuck off. Yeah, <laughs> fuck right? off. Isn't that kind of how he yeah, says it? Yeah, so anyway, it. I just wanted to be clear about that. Yeah, sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash sunny, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash sunny to take your business to the next level today. Are you listening to what Charlie just said? I just said it. Shopify.com slash sunny. Are you listening? Shopify.com slash sunny. Are you listening? Yeah, go. That's and how if you're you... not, fuck off. Fuck off. Sir Bingsley, may I come in? What the hell kind of high flute name is that? I answer the one name and one name only. And that's Billy the Kid. Uh, all right, Billy the Kid. Well, hang on. Don't drop the sir part now. Excuse me? Sir Billy the Kid. I think that gonna suit me just fine. Got kind of a nice ring to it, don't it? How about you call me that from now on, all right? Yeah, make an announcement to whoever y'all is out there, right? It's Sir Billy the Kid from now on. Listen to me, fuckface. You're either a sir and an actor from England, or you're Billy the fucking kid, but you can't be both. Let's talk a little bit about Glenn's performance in the movie. But uh, that's the thing, that honestly is the thing that made us laugh the most, and I were on, <laughs> we were, were on it and watched it again. And that just shows a few things. One, how much we love Glenn, but be, how our sense of humor is very specific. It's and so I don't specific. know if the rest of the audience is gonna find it the funniest scene. I thought it was the funniest well, scene. Well, I, I tell you what, I, I've screened the movie, you know, a few times, not like with an audience, um, like, uh, you know, in uh, color stages and whatever. And you always get a huge laugh, whether people know Sonny or they don't, because mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. you're a great, great performer. And it's a funny scene, and you nailed it. And you <laughs> you did a choice that I was like, oh, this is what you want to do, but let let's go for it. Well, we yeah, because it wasn't written. The, the character wasn't written with an accent, and I just had this. I just had this funny idea of like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and we were, Kate and I were trying to identify the accent. There, you can't. You can't. Because the yeah. whole thing was what, what I was attempting was like the broad, it was a, what I was calling a European accent, which, you know, isn't a thing, obviously. Oh, like at one point I was gonna, I don't think I wound up changing your credit to- European business manager? <laughs> vaguely European business manager. Vaguely <laughs> European, oh, that's right, vaguely <laughs> European. Yeah, it was like, I wanted to do, I wanted it to be like, where is this person from? Is he but from- But you know, it wound up, it was great because it really wound up playing into the tone of like identity yes. and you're like- It worked out nicely, yeah. What Not, not what I was, I mean, I was just thinking, I don't know. It just kind of struck me. It, it wasn't like I was making a choice based on what I felt like it would fit in with the movie. It was just <laughs> something that made it interesting to me was to just make him vaguely European. No, you crush in the movie. I, and uh, It was fun. It there's was lots fun. of sunny uh, things that- There's so many sunny, sunny people. And yes. Easter eggs Tones and things and that will, and any ones we might not catch. Uh, sunny little. fans are going to have lots of, to chew on. Well, um, Jillian Bell's not a sunny actor, but she, she I, feels like one. She feels like, like one, she yeah. She's amazing. She's amazing. <laughs> she's amazing. Um, the know, shit she's singing to you. Like <laughs> <laughs> which wasn't in my first cut. Leslie found that. She's I like somehow singing. had missed that. I was like, oh, this is great. She's it's like singing go. something about like being banana. hungry. Yeah, and beige, beige banana. banana. Yeah, beige banana. <laughs> yeah, beige banana. <laughs> it's so um, funny. Well, you did a great job. Thanks, guys. You did a great job without us. I'm excited for people to see this movie. I'm very excited. What's the date again? Uh, the same day. May 12th. May 12th. May 12th. Yeah. May 12th is the day. It's the same day. Go Blackbird. out to the goddamn theaters, you fucking creeps. This is a movie I, I would personally want to see it in the theater if I wasn't doing or, or involved in it. Like, I miss comedies in the theater. I miss, yeah, like, the laughing experience. with a group of people. Yeah. Like, why do we think... Why does the industry think people don't want that anymore? Maybe they don't want as much as they want a Marvel movie, but they still want it. Like, don't yeah. take it away completely. Anyway... You have a chance to go see in the theater. You also have a chance to go see Blackberry, Blackberry. starring Glenn Howerton. Oh, buddy. <laughs> now let's get into this. Okay. 
Guys, two, two, two fifty. Here's what I'm gonna do. I will give you twenty thousand dollars cash today. I'll sell the phone. I'll work out this problem with USR, but I want fifty percent of the company, and I've got to be CEO. That's. Uh, Are you joking? No. What was obviously? Think about obviously, it? no, no. You should digest it, Mike. Okay, okay. Who is in charge here? Well, let me set, set this up for the audience a little bit. So the movie's about the making of the BlackBerry, which was, uh, for our young audience, predated the iPhone as the device that really put emails and internet on a phone and sort of was the breakthrough thing. And, and a fantastic I, device. And a fantastic device. And um, But just got just crushed by the iPhone. But um, I always like a movie, and, and Glenn plays sort of a, a, the businessman who helps the tech guys take this from just an idea to uh, a mm -hmm. successful business. I always enjoy a movie about a real life event. It's inherently interesting, right? Because you're like, it's like you're looking at a time machine, you're getting to see the past. But it was so second to me than the real magic trick of this film, which was a filmmaker finally giving Glenn Howerton <laughs> the, the chance to take on a rich and dynamic character and uh, with, with the training wheels completely off. I mean, the character starts at a 10, mm, uh, yeah. but we like seeing Glenn Howerton at a 10. He hello. You have a collect call from. What the fuck is happening? Will you accept the charges? There. Yeah, yes, I, I accept. Thank you. Mike? Hi. There are three reasons why people buy our phones. Do you know what they are? For email. They fucking work. But every inch of the of the movie, every frame that you are in is so compelling. My only complaint is that you are not in every single second <laughs> of the film. And by the way, you're in the majority of the film. So no one's not going to get yeah. a full dose of you. But I could have watched that guy brush his teeth. Yeah. I could I could have watched the story of that guy from the beginning to end. And I like the other story too. And I like the movie a lot. The movie's great. But holy shit, man, you're so fucking good. Oh man, thank you. Yeah. And I just want, I want so much more of that. I want more movies like that. In fact, I was, I was, yeah. I was jealous watching it be, be like, why didn't I make a Glenn Harrison movie <laughs> where I, where I have you like, in every scene doing your thing. Let me well, sell the movie you. again to be just because I want people to go see the movie and not just Glenn's performance. The, 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 they end with a Chiron that's not giving anything away. Everybody already knows this. It says, and this is considering at this point, there was a massive amount of different cell phone companies that were out there, the Razors and the Nokias of the world and, and all sorts of different cellular companies that were coming out and carriers. And it was uh, the Wild West. It was before... Um, Android really came into existence. It was before the iPhone had come into existence. And and BlackBerry had 45% of the market cap. I mean, almost half of everybody in the world that had a mobile phone had a BlackBerry mm -hmm. in 2009 or eight or whatever it was. And now that number is zero, zero. Yeah. So this movie is tracking the beginning and the rise of this massive company, and then it's inevitable crash. And to take a movie, that, that's like an inherently exciting story, but you're not used to hearing about stories about a business being fascinating. And this feels like a thriller, yeah. almost. You're yeah. watching a and thriller. And even knowing that going in doesn't make it any less exciting to watch that happen. No, well, you it's, know. You know yeah. that in your pocket you have an iPhone. Yeah. And that, so you're either old enough to remember BlackBerry or you're not. But to hear that they at one point had fifty percent of the mar of the market, and now and now everybody's yeah. walking around with these. That's what the story is yeah. really about, yeah. and how these disparate personalities were able to build that, and then not able to beat the iPhone. There was no bad guy. It seemed yeah. at one point that Glenn's character was the bad guy, but in the end, yeah. they all had fallibility. That all, was a really interesting aspect of that movie. That each one of them. You, th there wasn't like a sort of redeeming ending. You're like, but you know, well, maybe the the what's the character with the headband? Um, Doug. Doug. Maybe Doug. they said like, okay, he was sort of our our good guy, sort Ish. of. Ish. Because without, but but the argument could be made that without the other two, Doug's success doesn't exist either. Unless the carriers rebuild their entire networks, there's nothing we can do. The phones use too much data. Well, then fucking shrink it. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, we looked into that. Uh-huh. I 
These guys can't do it. What do you mean they can't do it? You said they were the best engineers in the world. I said they're the best engineers in Canada. Well, okay, all right. Who could do it? Maybe top guys from Motorola or Microsoft or Google. Okay. Wait, what, 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 are, you, what are you doing? Who else? Where else? John Cormack. Get John Cormack from ID. Can you guys hear me? The guy who made Doom. What's Doom? Have you played Wolfenstein? Please just don't tell any more folks. Can you hear me? Yes, yes! Oh, shit. There's something about your performance that makes it very clear that you are right. Even yes. though you're unlikable, that there's something oh, right that's about what's so what funny. He's watch. really, really good yes. at what he does. Because yes. you want to yeah. watch, you're, you're playing a guy who's clearly, he's got the anger issues and he's emotionally unstable, but he's good. So it's a gunslinger, right? Like, you know, he's the best gunslinger in town. So you want to watch him. Mm -hmm. And that's always a really good yeah. sort of narrative to be like, can I watch the expert do the, his, be an expert at it? And we want to see you manipulate people. Well, you know, what's we, funny is I had the same fear going into this that I had in early days of Sonny, where I was like, he's going to be so unlikable Mm. That you're not, and, and I was like, I think you do need to be rooting for this guy. And yet, he, uh, you know, he has to be so ruthless. And, and you did hit the nail on the head. I mean, the main thing is he is incredibly competitive. The real Jim is incredibly competitive. And I think he- To a he, fault, it destroys him. Yes, it destroys him. And, and he had, but he had to be in order to build that company the mm -hmm. way that he did. But- And he's not the reason that it fails. He's not really the reason. They 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 suggest this, some of the shady dealing business dealings, which everybody was doing at that no, time. He's not the reason. He's not the reason. He was no. not the visionary. No, there was, the there was a visionary who didn't see that there was a Mike, better vision out there. Mike did not. Mike was not doing his job mm -hmm. properly. Right. He was the one who was meant to see where the market was headed. That's what he did so well when he created the BlackBerry, and he was so. Uh, uh, enamored of his own invention that he didn't see that somebody was about to take his lunch. And that's, and you're right, because my character the whole time is like, Mike, we, are you doing your thing? You do your thing, yeah. I'm you doing do mine. I'm, I'm out here yeah. selling phones. Yeah. I'm doing yeah. my thing. Are you making the thing that we need to be selling? You know, yeah. But you know, here's the thing about likability. And it's the same thing with Sonny that we always did, which is that if, can I understand their want? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because we know your want, you know, you've taken out your, a loan, you're, you've mortgaged your own house, and we know that you want, and you're not being taken seriously enough within your business when we meet your character. Yeah. And we know that, you know, you refer to the people, you're like, this, this great line it's like, why did they fire you? And you, you know, you <laughs> nail it. You're like, because they're idiots, you know, <laughs> um, with no sort of wink to the line, just like pure, just like, that's a fact. Yeah. Uh, but we know your want and we identify with your want. So you can be an asshole, you can be a ruthless, but we know you want this thing and we know you're, in some ways you deserve it because you are good at what you do. So well, this is likability is, it's just the wrong word no, no, to really, describe the thing that people, yeah. And yeah. It, it's, it is a character compelling or not? And what makes a person compelling? And being nice and polite and likable are social constructs that are fucking bullshit and don't belong in yeah, narrative. Like it's what, not what makes uh, people interested. What movies are have that, you know? Yeah. There's no inherent conflict. But you still, it's like, to me, it's less about likability, more about rootability. Like I knew that you needed to be rooting for this guy. You didn't need to necessarily like him, but you did need to be rooting for him on some level. Um, but, the, but the thing is, is like through my experience of, of you know, playing uh, such a horrible person on It's Always Sunny. I real I, 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 I allowed myself to go to that place and to be right on the edge almost of, of rootability, just because in my experience, you're right. It is, it is, I was like, it, it just, I, it'll be compelling, you know, it'll be interesting to watch. And I think you'll understand where he's coming from if I do my job right. Like if you see, if you can see the thoughts that are going through my head, the calculations that I'm making. But also, like, I had a tremendous amount of trust in, in Matt Johnson, yeah. who's who wrote and directed the movie. The great with, director. He, he wrote it with his uh, producing partner, Matt Miller. Um, they wrote the movie together, and he he directed it. Um, and, of course, Axe in it plays Doug. Um, and 
is just yeah. I did he's not a, know that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, the guy who played Doug direct. Oh director. my god, I he's such a dummy in the movie. Yeah. That it's, yeah. Oh, he's, he's an assassin. Wow. Um, so uh, um, we've been talking here, and we we. Um, we would like to make a counteroffer. You keep crawling back, like bugs, like grubs. Yep. Um, so, we would like to offer you 10% for $500,000. Are you out of your fucking mind? I look at 100,000 deals a day. I pick one. Is that the quote? No, I look at 100 deals a day. I pick one. Wall Street. He's an incredibly smart guy. I mean, when I read the script, I was like, this, this script is so, it's so smart. It's so well done, yeah. it, 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 you know? And then in talking to him and seeing his previous uh, films, I, I felt like I could trust that if I wasn't doing the right thing, that would, the thing that was going to make the best version of the movie, that he would have told me. So I just kind of, like you said, I took the training wheels off and just was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I think is right here and let's, yeah. let's just see what happens. That's right. We're sponsored by everyone's favorite uh, green drink powder. That's Athletic Greens. Yeah, no one here is a stranger to Athletic Greens or their delicious AG1 powder, but we never tire of singing their praises. With one scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75, 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. Adaptogens. Here's a pro tip. The best time to do it, to take AG1, is in the morning on an empty stomach. You just no breakfast, no coffee, just drink AG1, and then wait about 10 minutes before you eat anything. You feel that sensation of, what do they call it? Being alive? Ooh. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, That's good. The That's best good. sensation there is, man. Because I personally, I, I went from being on a mostly plant diet to a, a mostly meat diet. Okay, let's be honest. <laughs> You know, which changed uh, almost all my meals, but never once did I miss my daily dose of AG1. I got to get my greens, right? So I got to get my meats. You got to have the greens. And it's I got to have my greens. Part because, of, a, of, a, of a balance. Yeah, in your life. You, well, you got to have good gut health, and AG1 really helps with gut health. Well, that's because it's backed by the latest science with constant product iterations and third party testing. So you know you're always getting the best of the best. That's right. AG1, make your vitamins better than everyone else's vitamins. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash sunny. That's right. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash sunny to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Well, uh -huh. uh, I was hoping Rob was going to be here today, mm. but... We're missing the hot takes of Rob Justice, I gotta say. It's well, yeah. But moreover, I need to... I'm, I need clarity on whether we're getting these tickets to the Wrexham Manchester United game in July. I want those tickets. I know. It's still like a ways away, but um, I feel like the tickets are going to go quickly. They will. And I don't want them to go without me having them. I want the good ones. You know what I mean? The good ones, they go. If it comes down to the wire, you guys could always get them on game time. Say what? <laughs> Okay, no. Tell me more about game time. Oh, I've actually heard of that now. Now that I'm thinking of it, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. they have uh, that app where you can get epic last minute ticket bargains. Wait, this is fantastic. Okay, so you don't have to wait for tickets to go on sale and try to hoard through the, the millions of fans that are trying to get them. No, now I wait until right before, sometimes even day of, and I always land the best seat left in the house. That's great. Don't wear yourself out running up and down the field. You know, just sit back and uh, wait to strike on goal when it's your time. You know what I mean? <sighs> Sorry, I thought that would impress Rob, but, yeah, uh, yeah, but he's no, not he's here. not here. So snag your tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code SUNNY for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code SUNNY for 20 bucks off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I also want to compliment you. I feel like two, three lines in, there was no Dennis to me. There was no Glenn. You know, like, obviously you see your friend, you're bald, 
I know you're not bald. I I know you're not a man in Canada. So, you know, like... <laughs> well, he was. For he was a man in Canada. Canada. I, know you're a man a man Canada. Canada. I know you're not a man from Canada. Uh-huh. I know you don't, you don't care for hockey. Um, uh, there's, you know, obviously there's always that thing in a movie where you're like, well, that's, uh, you know, that's Sean Penn doing a limp in a wig. But like... Uh, <laughs> Two, two, three lines in, and you're just in. That's and good. you are that guy, and you're consistent from beginning to end. How did I have two questions? Performance. Wait, can questions. I speak to that? Can I speak to that? Yes, because, please. because I think you both, you guys both accomplished that. Um, that I was most impressed with. To Charlie's point, you, you, you do this long enough, and your friends are acting and things, and you see them. And it's hard to distance yourself because you're spending so much time with them sure. off camera. Of course. And you're seeing them pull out the tricks that we all use. Yeah, we know all the moves. Yes. And so I'm used to seeing every move that you have and every move that you have. That's why I think, and we didn't talk about this at all, but how fascinating it is that one of the one of the defining characteristics of you as a performer and you as a person is, is your actual voice, mm. which is so distinct and fascinating. And to Meg touched on this a little bit, but to take that away from yourself, I think was very brave because it's a crutch that you can use. And it's also a, t- a tool that you can use to express yourself, your mm. voice. But it also was so smart because it took, th- it took you as a performer and as a person and made you completely um, unrecognizable to me mm. as I'm watching it. Cause I'm, I'm watching you going, well, that still looks like Charlie, but it certainly doesn't sound like Charlie. And he's doing something I've never seen you do before. Oh, thanks man. And, and with Glenn, um, yeah, the baldness, like the, the, it wasn't the look it was no, it was the, the delivery, the delivery and your eyes, dude, I was looking in your eyes. I'm like, I've never seen Glenn make that expression before. Yeah. It was cold calculated killer. And Dennis is not, even though we no, joke no, that he is, no. is not like that. No, it's not Dennis Reynolds at all. And it's not Glenn Howerton being angry. It's that character. Now, let me ask you this. Did you meet with the guy? Did you base any stuff off him? Because you're playing a real person, which is interesting. Yeah, uh, no, actually. Um, I, I only had, uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, I really only had about three, three and a half weeks to prep for that movie. So I knew I had to make it, I knew I didn't have time to do all the research that you would want to do ultimately in most ideal circumstances and also prepare the actual performance Mm -hmm. based on the material. So, you know, Matt and I both felt very strongly that, you know, Jim, he's known a little bit, he's known in Canada, but but most people don't know him. He hasn't given a lot of on-camera interviews, but he doesn't have a lot of like, yeah, people don't know what he's really like, what his tics are, what he sounds like, and, you know, what his, you know, uh, body language is like. Most people just don't know what that is. And we just felt like that was less important to focus on. I also knew that Matt and Matt had done so much research. You know, they they interviewed countless ex-employees and all these things to, to, to really find out who these characters were and what they were like, you know. So I really tried to just focus on on the character that I was reading in the script and and what I felt like that that character should should come off as but uh, but I did event I did meet the real Jim uh, had he seen the recently movie? in Toronto yeah so he had been sent the film uh, he watched it um, he actually did an interview and kind of responded you know and and for the most part was like very like very complimentary of the film and you know had some had a couple gripes about the way things went down he's like that's not really how it went down you know um which is understandable but uh but then he came to the toronto premiere and i met him before the premiere and he was he was he was lovely it was it was a super I was nervous to meet him. Sure. You know what I mean? Because I was like- Because it's a ruthless performance. I don't so want to meet like... the man that I played. <laughs> I, I don't want to meet the man, not, you know what I'm saying? I don't want to meet the person that I was portraying because- Because <laughs> he was, was scary. He was kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's kind of scary. Um, but he was he was lovely. He was lovely. Yeah, he's very. he can be a very charming guy too. Um, and then he watched the premiere with an audience and and I think he really- enjoyed it. You know, seeing it with an audience, I think it really came alive for him more mm. than watching it by himself. And he told me, he said, that's the, oh, this, he was like going into it. He said, this, this will be the only time I've ever seen a movie more than once. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that now, seen a movie now how did, yeah, that tracks with that, that character. With that, yeah. how, how did you, um, did you and Mike like work really closely on figuring out the levels? Because, you know, you, you make a movie, you don't shoot it in sequence, right? You yeah. shoot, you, because of the locations, you might be shooting the last scene first. You're you're bouncing all around. So, was it difficult to track 
where to be with this guy emotionally because, you know, you, I'm sure you wanted to be aware of how often you were out of 10, you mm, know, and then yeah. when to play him down. How, how did you guys navigate that? It seems to me like you were always, when the character walked into a room, he was at an eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which but was, it was really simmering, compelling. Yeah. Really compelling because you don't know when it's going to go to a 10 at any mo moment. But it's an eight, not of anger, but of anxiety, like controlled anxiety and rage that's just sitting right under the surface and mm -hmm. ready. And everybody around you, so the audience, every, every character like sits up straighter and everybody in the audience is, it, can't wait to see how Jim's going to react in this moment. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, for as much experience as we all have like on, ca on camera uh, and, and acting with lights and a boom operator and makeup people all over you and all this shit, like I have a lot of, a lot of I'm very comfortable on camera at this point, but what I don't actually have a lot of experience with, almost no experience actually, is scoring a film performance. Yeah. Because in TV, your character doesn't really change. Mm -hmm. And after you've done two or three episodes, you know the character so well, you know, I, I don't, I, I could slip into d the Dennis like that. Like it's just, it's, it's just like, like the flip of a switch, you know? So the challenge becomes how do I get myself to the point where I feel the same way walking on the set playing Jim as I do playing Dennis, who I've played for 13 years? How can I maximize the three and a half weeks that I have to prepare for this so that I feel just as comfortable playing Jim as I do playing Dennis? And they're two completely different human beings. And mm -hmm. Jim's totally, both characters are totally different than, than I am. There's aspects, of course, there have to be. I'm pulling from my own experience, my own life and all that kind of stuff. But, but scoring a performance, that was a real challenge for me. I really, you know what I did? I, I, I took the I remember hearing a thing that Anthony Hopkins said years and years and years ago. And I really was like, okay, I think that that's a really good place to start, which is just read the script over and over yeah, and over for and sure. over and over. Because unlike over. Sonny, we have, you, you know, you, you didn't write this one. So when, yeah. when we're writing Sonny, yeah, yeah, yeah. the amount of weeks and months that have gone into writing that episode, you just know it so well you might forget like some of the, lo the specific lines but you know why the character wants what they want in each moment but your characters our characters don't have an arc so either way it doesn't matter as much but you're yeah, right the right, character right. has to you know start in one place and end in a different place um so it was just reading the script over and over again and having a lot of conversations with matt about matt johnson about um each scene and sort of what he was picturing and finding out that for the most part we were almost always on the same page great about the way it would play. Um, but you know, Matt also shot it in a way uh, where the coverage was very simple and we could play with it. So there were a lot of variations of those scenes that, you know, so that- Mostly handheld, right? Yeah, like felt on, very documentary. Cross so what, it, what they did is they shot it on a, oh, I'm forgetting the, the name of this thing. Okay, so this was, this was super, the way he shot the movie was super, super interesting. I almost never knew where the cameras were. Wow. He would have a camera uh, like, so it's a long lens, so it like a hundred feet away on a long lens, and I I was always asking him like where where's the camera? He's like he's like it's, it's over there, and I'd be like what? It's like wild, wildlife photography. Walk out. Yeah, it was like that's exactly what it was. It was mm. wildlife, and what they did is they put it on um, oh God, I'm forgetting the name of this thing, but basically it was on a a, a a tripod, but on the tripod there was a ball, this ball, this like bouncy ball, like a gimbal, a gimbal. Yeah. It was a gimbal, so they could they could hold it and have it. You know, because you don't want to be, you can't be that, you can't be handheld when you're on that long of a lens. Yeah. Anyone who knows mm -hmm. anything it's about cameras. It's going to get too shaky. It gets too shaky. So, but on a gimbal, you can add just a little bit of a handheld mm. feel to it and have it feel handheld, even though it it wasn't technically mm. handheld. That gave it that thriller feel you're talking yes. about. And and that's that, that's one of the things that I really love about the movie, watching it too, because I, uh, is that it does, it's like a really interesting mix of like, you feel like you're watching a thriller mm. and yet it is funny but it's not overtly comedic, but it is funny. Yeah. Um, it's just like a, a good example of, you know, how when car you play it real, but the, 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 it's so outrageous. Mm -hmm. I think that's where a lot of the comedy was coming from for, for Matt and for us. It was like, the more outrageous this is, mm -hmm. the, 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 the funnier it is. And, and, but it was, it's all based on real shit. But yeah. I mean, I, 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 I definitely was not approaching this as a, as a comedy at all. I'm so glad you did it. I yeah. think, uh, any wink to that character would it would have hurt the movie. You know, the fact that you played it dramatic and serious is just 
it drives the story. Mm-hmm. I have a prediction. The prediction is this. <clears throat> Within a month of this movie coming out, the phone is going to be ringing for Glenn Howard. <laughs> and I can tell you just anecdotally, I've already told you this, but I was at a football game with Sean Levy, the director, and he came up to me and said, I just have to tell you, I saw this movie called The Blackberry Movie, and your friend Glenn is amazing in it. Can yeah. you tell him I said he's amazing? And I said, fuck you. You tell him. <laughs> you tell him. And he's like, I want to cast him in something. I'm like, definitely tell him that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so many times over the years, we feel like, I certainly feel like our cast is overlooked when it comes to casting some of these yeah. movies. And I see some of these jerk offs that get these movies. And I'm like, what? How are these people being cast in this when we have these people mm-hmm. on our show? And I'm just glad. And I, I, I'm just glad that people are finally recognizing that for both of you guys. And like, it only took I'm 16 you, years, <laughs> uh, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, no, it's, it's, I it's hope the been... phone's ringing for you too, pal. Like, you. I mean, you, you deserve it for sure. It, it does frustrate me. It, it, like, and it will frustrate me. Like it, when people are like, and Glenn is, is really good in this movie. Who knew? Uh, like, that's, who knew? Well, I think I think that that is that, that 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 is shifting. Know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I do think that that is that is shifting, and yeah. and I'm happy to see that happening. And I have a theory about that, but we can't get into it now because we're out of time. But uh, but I appreciate you guys watching the movie, and and uh, um, and I'm glad that I. Took a, I felt like I was taking a big swing, but I wouldn't have been able to take that big swing if I didn't know that if it, if I failed miserably, I wouldn't have this to fall back on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, really, it does. It uh, gives you the confidence. Not just economically, but emotionally. Emotionally, right? yes. And I was no, reminded you know, of your you trampoline a, speech. Like, but, but I wouldn't have ha- had the confidence to take that backflip <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't there. Yeah, 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 uh, exactly. <laughs> which resulted in you talking about how you licked someone's, <laughs> licked asshole, someone's just asshole just a little just bit. A little just bit. A little it bit. wasn't great. It wasn't great, but it was fine. It was fine. It was fun. <laughs> so you're licking somebody's asshole on a trampoline, and uh, I'm wondering why you're not getting cast in mainstream. Wait, movies. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're like, why are people not get it? May 12th, everybody go out see Black Double Harry. feature. Now, I will say that I wrote, directed, uh, and financially engaged. It's been 10 years of my life. Yeah. And Glenn is also in my movie. Yeah. Mm. So please <laughs> see please, that one see, first. Please see that because it's a win-win for Glenn either way. I'm proud of you guys. Thanks, man. I'm Thanks, proud of you guys. Let's Appreciate make some it. more stuff Amazing. together. Let's right. keep doing it. Yeah.